So uh, this insect is problematic because it's developed the resistance to the pyrethroids and to the uh, BT genes. Okay. So that's uh, that's our first pest. Second pest, wireworms. What makes this a particular problem is that it's, uh, we have inconsistent data regarding the effectiveness of soil insecticides to uh, manage the, these pests. Uh, we've had a number of trials, uh, insecticide trials over the years, where in one trial, MOCAP stands out, looks really great compared to all the others. The next year, next year uh, MOCAP doesn't do anything, and one of the other so insecticides is the one that looks like it should be used all the time, and so on and so on. There's no consistency in, uh, in the uh, soil insecticide products. And then, on top of that, we have very incomplete knowledge of the biology of the wireworms. Uh, it makes it really difficult to manage these pests when you don't know exactly what the heck they're doing in the soil. Third on the list is uh, carrot weevil. Uh, this is an insect we definitely don't have uh, full knowledge of its biology. It's a, a very difficult pest to manage in uh, carrots and process fresh market carrots and then parsley. Um, and we also have uh, a loss of insecticidal products that were effective on it, but no, no longer registered. And then lastly, pepper weevil. Uh, this is uh, an insect that's uh, apparently developing some pyrethroid resistance. And uh, it's a pest that is effectively controlled in the stages. There is no currently available insecticide that will manage this pest. So for pepper fields that become infested, it's a race between the farmer and the weevil as to who gets the last pepper in the field. So we'll start off with corn earworm. And here we have uh, an earworm in the uh, butt end of this uh, uh, sweet corn ear. It's doing very well. It bored in through the husk and is entered in chewing away. Um, <clears throat> this is our primary sweet corn pest. Oh, and I meant to say, uh, most of my observations come from working in New Jersey, and I was a private consultant in Michigan for a few years. And so the information I'm providing you is based on, on my time in New Jersey and in Michigan. Corn earworm is the major sweet corn pest we have in, in New Jersey. And uh, uh, we've been involved in a multi-state uh, trial with Galen Dively out of University of Maryland now for three years. And he's been looking at the uh, problem resistance to the BT genes in corn earworm and uh, is amassing a, quite a pile of data that uh, I'll talk about as we uh, move along on the earworm. Uh, the life stages of the corn earworm, it's a very variable looking insect. Uh, the caterpillar up here is normally what we see of it. Um, this particular caterpillar is green. And the way I <coughs> find it easiest to recognize the earworm caterpillars is it looks to me like there's a highway down the back with this uh, line here in the center like the yellow line on the road. And if you look closely, you can see fine lines that run the length of the, uh, the caterpillar. And to me, that makes it an easy way to, to recognize it. Aside from that, uh, in both the larvae and the adults, the coloration is highly variable. And that adds some confusion for some people recognizing what the pest is that they have. Um, the larvae can be anywhere from this green to a yellow brown to a red to a pink color and shades in between, uh, gray even. In the adults, the patterns in the wings are always the same, but the amount of coloration, the lightness or darkness, is highly variable. And very often we see light-colored moths through the early season, and when you get into the fall, it seems like in general the moths are darker, uh, have darker markings and coloration than they did earlier in the summer. So at any rate, <coughs> they look very different. Uh, from specimen to specimen. Uh, and of course, they lay their eggs singly in the silk of the sweet corn. The eggs hatch. The, the 
caterpillars, the larvae, then chew their way down through the silk and start feeding in the uh, ear tip of the corn and uh, sometimes causing a very minimal damage, but other times causing significant damage that becomes secondarily infected with sap beetles and, and uh, various rots. So they can, they can start uh, making a mess in the ears. Okay, in New Jersey, we've had two ways of tracking the populations of earworms. One is with the black light trap, over here on the left. Uh, the vegetable IPM program in New Jersey is about 35, 40 years old now, been in existence that long. And uh, that whole time period, we've been relying on the black light traps as the primary means of knowing what's going on with corn earworm as well as other insect pests. But uh, along about 2005, 2006, we begin to get some grumblings from farmers particularly uh, near the Delaware uh, River, where they said that uh, they were getting uh, earworm damage in their 4th of July corn. And like, and we'd go back and look at the data from black light traps, and it wasn't doing anything. What's going on? Uh, the trap says there isn't anything out there, but yet when you look at the harvest of the ears, there is damage. So something, something was up. Not sure yet what what that is. Uh, so we started using Texas pheromone traps, in addition to the black light traps. Starting in 2008, we had uh, a, a deployment of uh, five or six of these, and since then, we have uh, continued to increase the number of these traps. and And I think now we're beginning to rely more on these traps for keeping track of the earworm population than the black lights. Um, there's an added benefit to using this uh, Texas pheromone trap that we hadn't really thought about, and that is with a black light trap, you can't see what you've caught because the, the insects fly into these veins, they drop down into this funnel, finally into the canister, and they're killed in there by a pest strip. And you, can't, you don't know what you have until you dump out the canister. But in the pheromone trap, you can see easily the numbers of moths that we're catching here. And so uh, I have farmers that, uh, when I go out to the field to, to count the number of moths in the traps, they, they're telling me, well, I know I've got a lot of moths or I don't have many. And one, one of the farmers uh, down in Cape May County has become so good at it that he tells me in advance how many moths he believes are in the traps. And most of the time, he's pretty accurate. So it gives the farmers sort of a better idea of what's going on, the on in the crop uh, using the Texas pheromone trap than it is relying on the black light traps, and that's sort of an added benefit. And besides, it gets farmers participating in the whole process of managing the, the pests, and, uh, and that's a nice thing to have. Oftentimes you get the feeling, well, we provide the data, but whatever becomes uh, using that data? Well, when the farmers can actually see what's in the traps and uh, <clears throat> get kind of into the whole idea of managing this number of moths, then it, it's, it makes it a, a better arrangement. Uh, this particular uh, trap I uh, took a photo of this summer. Uh, this is from the Green Creek Farm in Cape Bay County. There are 1,800 moths, over 1,800 moths in this basket. Uh, we had 260 moths per night for seven weeks back in August, which is the largest number that I've ever tracked in these pheromone traps. And uh, uh, the, uh, the farmer was beside himself because we recommend uh, the farmers go on a three-day spray schedule when we get over 20 moths a night. What do you do when you have 260 moths a night? You know, it, 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 you know, do you spray every three days, every two days? Do you spray in the morning and then again in the afternoon? You know, we don't have any guidelines uh, to say what, what the spray schedule ought to be. But fortunately, the people that said, screw it, I'm not going to spend that extra money. I'm just going to stay on a three-day schedule. They did not have any significant earworm damage. 
So maybe it doesn't matter what you get above 20 miles a night. Maybe it doesn't matter how many you catch. But certainly had me worried, uh, if not the farmer. Okay, so what's what's going on? Why are we getting so many moths in the in the trap? Um, because we have these uh, historical data now for a number of years, I went back and I picked out nine farms across the state and tallied up uh, the black light trap catches uh, the number of moths per night across the season for each of the years up to last year. And we started off with nearly three and a half moths per night back in 1998, 99. And then you can see that we had wild fluctuations in the number of moths in the traps. But in general, this is sort of a downward trend. What happened in 2010, I'm not sure, but we had definitely had a spike in numbers and then a long decline that ended in uh, 2014. If we lay this against uh, the use of Bt corn, sweet corn, field corn, it really started becoming used back here in the, in the end of the 1990s and certainly through the early 2000s. And that may be the primary reason that we seem to have a general decline in the numbers. Again, what happened in 2010, I don't know. But we, uh, uh, we had this long decline then in numbers to the point that uh, this is less than half a earworm moth per night in the black light trap across the season. But since 2014, the numbers have started increasing again. I haven't had time to include this year's data, but I have a hunch this trend is going to keep going up. Uh, we, we caught a tremendous number of moths this summer. When I took uh, the pheromone traps, uh, starting in 2008, I looked at the number of uh, days where we had over 20 moths a night, tallied those, and that's what these bars represent, the number of nights when we had 20 or more moths per night. It's not an exact match, but it's pretty darn close. Follows the same, pretty much the same trend as the black light trap. So it tells me that these numbers are are real. This is this is a real phenomena. We had a lot of fluctuation in, uh, back in uh, the early 2000s, and uh, but the combination of uh, the Bt corn, the Bt crops in general, plus effective insecticides, really put a dent probably in this population. But in 2014, things started to go bad, and the data that Galen Dively has collected illustrates that relative to the Bt corn. The corn earworm has become resistant to the Bt corn that has the Cry1 genes uh, in it so that they're, they're feeding uh, and surviving on it. That plus the increasing resistance to pyrethroid insecticides I believe is accounting for now this rather sharp increase in numbers. Uh, Galen figures that it's, it takes a lot of energy out of the corn earworm to, um, to overcome the toxicity of the Bt corn, and that may well be. Uh, the survivorship, uh, the, the, the caterpillars aren't quite as robust, the, the moths aren't as, maybe as large, uh, there may be a reduction in the number of eggs laid, but still they seem to be dealing with it. and. Otherwise, I don't think we'd be getting these in increasing numbers. So uh, that kind of illustrates a couple of points that uh, while we thought maybe we had corn earworm on the ropes, it's looking like we don't, and that we're going to have to make some adjustments in how we try to manage it. So the problem with corn earworm then is chemical resistant. It's become resistant to the pyrethroids and the Cry1 proteins from the Bt genes. The reason for this is that insects, especially those that feed on plants, but probably all insects to some degree, have compounds called P450s. These are proteins that the insect can manufacture and 
the, uh, the proteins are used to detoxify the food that they consume. Corn earworm, if you look at it, will feed on solanaceous plants, uh, eggplant, potato, um, tobacco, tomatoes, peppers, and so on. These plants have a lot of phytotoxins, and so the earworm is able to overcome these toxins, so uh, becoming resistant to the pyrethroids probably is not that big a deal for them. All right, so they've, as a, as a class, chemical class, they figured out how to detoxify the, uh, uh, the pyrethroids in general. Uh, consistent use of the pyrethroids, which is a group 3A IRAC uh, grouping, means that you continually expose earworms to the pyrethroids. And so gradually you're going to develop a population that you can do all the spraying you want and you won't bring, you won't decrease the numbers hardly at all. Um, <coughs> And in addition to that, since pyrethroids are broad spectrum insecticides, they kill the predators, the parasitoids of, uh, of earworm as well as corn leaf aphid. And so you may start seeing a spike in aphid populations later into the summer, especially where you're consistently using pyrethroid insecticides. Okay, so obviously this, is, this whole thing is going to affect the management of the corn earworm. Um, before we can get into the management, it's, it's a good thing to think about uh, Colorado potato beetle and how people have come to try to manage this. Uh, Colorado potato beetle is legendary for becoming resistant to almost every insecticide that's been used against it. And it's because of these compounds, these P450s, that the potato beetle has been able to develop resistance to the different compounds so that it got to a point where you could spray almost any insecticide you wanted and you couldn't kill the things. Um, but then somebody started looking, looking at the current insecticides being used and started to think, well, chemicals that were used back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, what about them? And they would bring back these older materials and make an application and discover, yeah, you can kill the potato beetles. Because over time, the previous materials that were used, they've lost the resistance to it. Unfortunately, after you use these older materials once or twice, the beetles bring back that resistance pretty quick. So you have a limited time to use them. But it brings up the idea then, what if you rotate your materials? Don't rely entirely on pyrethroids, in the case of earworms, but mix in other insecticides, such as besiege, which is a, a pyrethroid and a diamide, 3A and a 28 group, lanate, which is 1A, corrigin, which is a, a diamide, uh, group 28, and radiant, group 5. And there's other, other insecticides in different chemical classes that could be used in rotation. If you do that, then you greatly reduce the odds of having uh, resistant populations of earworm in your crop. What really kind of confuses the matter is we don't know where the earworms are coming from necessarily that we have arriving in our fields. They're a migratory insect. They started off in Texas along the Gulf Coast and they uh, migrate north and east <clears throat> and they reproduce along the way. So we don't know where these moths are coming from that we're getting. Some of them uh, probably matured here, but a lot of them are migrating in still from the southwest. So we have no idea what kind of resistance they have to other insecticides besides pyrethroids. So that becomes all the more important to rotate the classes, the chemical classes of insecticides to help manage these populations. And then also, <coughs> Uh, what about the BT uh, genes? If you are uh, raising sweet corn or other crops that corn earworm goes after, and you're relying on BT crops that include the CRY1 uh, genes, uh, the data that we've seen now for the last three years indicates that 
you're kind of wasting your money to have these BT crops if that's the reason you're trying to uh, uh, for managing the earworm. Uh, corn borer has not developed that resistance yet. So you can manage corn borer with, uh, with any of the BT uh, varieties. Uh, fall army worm, it's a little, it's a little more confusing. Um, a regional study done uh, a few years ago showed that at least in New Jersey, we get a mixture of, of fall ar army worm moths coming up from the Gulf Coast as well as coming up from the Atlantic Coast. And they mix over New Jersey, probably here too. And um, so sometimes the beet varieties in sweet corn in the oral stage, sometimes they work beautifully. You don't see any, mo uh, any caterpillars feeding on the plants at all. Other times, yeah, you get a few fall army worm that's surviving on this BT corn. So what's going on? And, and again, it depends on where these moths originated from. Some of them seem to have developed some resistance to the BT, others have not. The nice thing is that when these fall army worms are infesting the sweet corn, about one insecticide application cleans them out. They, they die rather readily. Uh, even though uh, they've survived the BT. Whereas uh, the other caterpillars uh, that don't show that resistance to the BT, it may take a couple of insecticide applications to get rid of them. So the point is, uh, they're, uh, the sweet corn varieties that have the BT cry one genes, if you're trying to manage earworm, you're gonna wind up having to spray silk and tassel sprays anyway, regardless of whether it's a BT or not, because if you don't, you're going to wind up with damage. Um, there's another stack gene that's included in uh, the Obsession 2 uh, series. Uh, Remedy is the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, varieties for it. And this one includes the VIP gene. Earworm has not developed resistance to this, at least no more than maybe one or two percent. And so this has been holding up very nicely. The trials that, uh, that we've had at the research farm in South Jersey are unsprayed, no chemicals applied to them. The remedy has come through 100% clean. No, no ear, earworm damage at all. Um, the uh, other varieties have been almost 100% damaged by earworm. It's only been the one that has the VIP gene in it that uh, has come through unscathed. Okay, So you may want to keep that in mind. Again, it depends on what's the major pest for you uh, that you have to deal with. <clears throat> okay, if anybody is getting drowsy or anything, I know my voice after lunch is a deadly combination. So if you feel like you need to stand up and stretch, go ahead. I you know, understand. Okay, moving on then, wire worms. Uh, this is a group of uh, insect pests that have just created all kinds of headaches uh, over the years because it's really difficult to figure out what's going on with an insect that's in the soil out of sight. Um, we have several species here in, in the area. In New Jersey, 90% 90, 90 or more of the damage that we see from wireworms is due to this one species, uh, Melanotus communis. Uh, it's, it's sometimes referred to as the corn uh, wireworm. And if you have a wireworm infestation in your field, this is maybe the first signs that you'll see that you have wireworms. You'll have dead seedlings, and when you dig these up, you'll find <coughs> that the uh, wireworm has chewed its way into the below ground uh, stalk just far enough to kill the growing point, and then it backs out and moves on to somewhere else. So when you dig up the plant, sometimes it's really hard to find that spot, but it's there, and you, if you take away the soil and maybe a leaf sheath or so, you'll see the hole where the wireworm went in and, and killed the plant. So like I say, this may be the first indication that you've got a wireworm problem, potential wireworm problem in the field. 
um, the, uh, that may not be the only kind of damage that you'll see. I've seen any number of times in cornfields, both field and sweet corn, where you have uh, seedling plants that have the yellow stripe on the margin. There's a striping there on this leaf and then that whiter band up there. And when you dig these up, <coughs> if you look really carefully, you can see where apparently a wireworm has come in and started to feed on the plant, but it hasn't killed it. It didn't get to the growing point, but it did damage the external uh, surface of the, of the seedling so that as this grows out, that damage causes the yellow stripe. Um, I don't know if this <coughs> really impacts uh, yield or not. I don't know if this corn plant will produce a marketable ear. Um, I've seen cases where some of these plants die and others seemingly grow up fine. I did have a study at one dairy farm where I was looking specifically at this. I had marked all the plants that uh, had showed the yellow stripe. Uh, the farmer told me that it would be at least a week before he was going to be ready to chop the corn for silage. And so I thought, well, this gives me plenty of time. So I next day I run out to the field to take my measurements. And no, he decided to take it early. Chopped off the entire field. I lost, I lost all the data. There's nothing I could compare. So I still don't know if this is really a loss or not. Okay, um, recently, <clears throat> one of the farmers uh, that we work with in New Jersey has encountered another way that Melanotis communis creates problems. Uh, they chew holes in drip tape. Um, this farmer raises about 500 acres of sweet corn. He does not have raised beds, but he does lay down drip tape for irrigation. The wireworms, and unfortunately the fields he has to work with, apparently have a fair number of wireworms in them because even after the drip tape issues, I can go out and I can find 8 9% uh, crop loss, stand loss, that is, from wireworm damage. But anyway, back to the drip tape. Apparently the wireworms, for whatever reason, like to chew through this stuff. And uh, it's gotten so bad that he has a crew dedicated to doing nothing more than driving up down rows of corn looking for puddles of water along on the uh, along the row and even sometimes you see a little squirt of water like a fountain shooting up in the air and so these guys hunt down the places where the wireworms have chewed the holes they get out dig out the drip tape splice in a new section and go on to the next spot um, <clears throat> I tried to review the data, or the uh, literature rather, and to see what the remedy for this is. And there, I found like one page of information. And the uh, person writing it up said, well, what they thought worked best was to, once you laid the drip tape, to immediately run water through it, or water with, uh, uh, with an insecticide. And that seemed to take care of the issue. But why wireworms do that is sort of a mystery. Um, Paul Johnson, who is uh, a wireworm specialist, uh, South, Dakota, South Dakota State University, told me that wireworms are actually predators, but when they're stressed, they do other things, like feed on plants and apparently chew holes and drip tape. And if that's the case, New Jersey creates a lot of stress because we have a lot of fields that are infested with, with uh, wireworms where they've caused damage. These are some of the other species that we have in New Jersey. Actually, these are photos taken from a publication called The Wireworms of Missouri, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Keister, Armand Keister. And uh, uh, it turns out that the wireworms we have in New Jersey are virtually the same as what they have in Missouri, at least attacking corn anyway, and other uh, field crops. And I suspect that they would be this, basically the same here in Delmarva, although you may be getting some wireworm species that occur in the south, maybe uh, here in the Maryland end of the peninsula. 
But at any rate, <coughs> um, Lamonius dubitans is the other wireworm species that causes some economic damage. So it's between the Lamonius and the Melanotus that cause 100% of our wireworm damage uh, that I've seen so far in New Jersey. Um, it feeds on the small grains <coughs> in the spring. Uh, if you have winter wheat or uh, winter barley and uh, you go out in the spring and you see the tillers growing up and you have yellow tillers, pull on that tiller and quite often as the stem breaks you'll realize there's a wireworm inside the, the tiller. And uh, I tried to do an estimation on the number of uh, damaged tillers I saw in one field. Um, and I was getting something on the order of 9% uh, of the tillers in the wheat was damaged uh, in this manner. But I really don't know how much of a yield loss that causes if the, if the wheat would send up more tillers in response or not. I, that I wasn't able to establish. Uh, I love the names for the uh, wireworms. This one is Hemicarpetius memnonius. This one is listed as a wireworm, though, go after corn, although I have not seen it attacking corn. Uh, but it does have big, heavy jaws, and it can bite. So if you do run across one, be careful how you handle it, because it can pinch pretty hard. Um, but I have seen it going after peppers, in a field of peppers where uh, there was a heavy load of peppers on the plant. Some of the peppers were resting down on the ground. Uh, this wireworm was coming up under the, the peppers in the soil, and boring into the fruit that was touching the ground. And I suspected that it was after moisture uh, because in this particular situation it was, a, it was a hot, dry period of that summer. And I think they were driven to uh, this kind of feeding by the moisture or lack of moisture. Uh, the Agriotes mancus, uh, we saw this in North Jersey. Um, and the one time that we had it uh, was in a, a, a potato uh, plot trial that was put into sod, uh, a heavy growth of sod, the uh, the year, the f yeah, the following year, it was in potatoes, and uh, when the plot was harvested, there was all kinds of wireworm damage on the tubers, and it was because of uh, this agarose mancus. That field was planted back to potatoes the following year, and there was no damage whatsoever. And apparently, this Agriotes mancus is a, is a wireworm that has a one-year life cycle. And apparently they're tied up with laying eggs and sod because once, uh, once the plot went to potatoes, they disappeared and was not a problem afterwards. So uh, that's what we can make out of that. This uh, Aeolus mellilus, this is a solitary wireworm that shows up here and there. Uh, I've never seen this being a problem anywhere. Uh, the Lamonius and the Melanotus, sometimes you can encounter whole areas of the field that are solid uh, with wireworms of those two species. And the Conoderis, uh down here in the corner, this one I, I've seen maybe like once in New Jersey. Um, so this, for us, is not, a, is not a pest. However, there is a tobacco wireworm called Conoderis uh, vericens uh, that's a significant pest of tobacco and other crops. OK, so that's our species. <clears throat> and the bad thing about all of this is we've known that wireworms are pests in crops for over 100 years. And we still know practically nothing about their biology. Um, and this is what makes it so aggravating to work on this insect. Um, as it related to the first class, wireworms are a pest that uh, uh, junior faculty are not encouraged to work on until they receive tenure. Because it's just so difficult to work on them. And if you pin your hopes on uh, advancing your career, do it after you become established. Then you can play around with them all you want. OK, yeah, relatively little information on wireworms as a whole. We don't even know for sure how long some of these species live in the soil. Uh, we do know that some species have a one-year life cycle. Apparently, there are some that have a three-year life cycle. But the Melanotus commonus, it's in the literature that that has like a five to six-year life cycle. So 
you easily have small kids at your farm or no farms with small kids who are younger than the wireworms are in the fields there, okay? For 80 years or more, this has been the information that's been disseminated that Melanotus communis can live this long in the soil. Uh, up until Paul Johnson, the uh, wireworm expert, said, nah, that's not really true. He said, nobody really knows how long it lives in the soil. The, the guy that produced this information didn't really keep a good track of his wireworms, and he didn't really know just how long they had been been in the soil. So anyway, we're still, still shooting in the dark, uh, trying to get information and, and ways to manage these. OK, none of notice communists, once they're in a, in, established in a field, that field seems to remain infested for years later. Um, when I first started working on the wireworms, the county agent told me that there were fields that he had dabbled with years before and pinpointed some of these fields. And I went out and sampled them, and sure enough, there were wireworms, a uh, significant number of wireworms in these fields. So uh, they tend to, tend to stay, uh, the fields tend to stay infested. Soybeans is the only crop that I've, that I've seen that has not been attacked by wireworms. Almost every other row crop, uh, vegetable crop, can be uh, uh, can be susceptible to wireworm damage. You have to, uh, to deal with wireworms, you have to know the, the pre rather the, uh, field, uh, you have to know that the wireworms are present before planting. And these are some of the insecticides, soil insecticides that are frequently used. Once, once the field is planted and then you discover that you have a significant wireworm infestation, it's too late. There's nothing you can do about it except to replant. So uh, this is a this is a real problem. So it's it's good to know uh, the field the field history before you plant regarding wireworms. Um, so there's uh, four ways we can kind of predict <coughs> uh, whether a field will have uh, infestation. One is to look at that field history. If there's been a significant uh, damage to wireworms in, in the last three or four years, you should use a soil insecticide. Uh, the other methods we can actually sample to get some idea of what's present. One is to use bait traps. You take a handful of uh, grain, one to one of wheat and corn seed, plant them in a, in a pack uh, here. You can put them in cheesecloth or just a handful dumped into a shallow hole about two inches deep. Let it sit there for 10, to, 10 days to two weeks, giving this time to germinate and for uh, seedlings coming up. And then dig them up and count the number of wireworms you find in that bait area. If you come up with an average of one or more, then you should be using a soil insecticide, especially if you intend on going with corn. Uh, using bait traps in one field, I was getting over 40 wireworms in a single bait trap. That field was way beyond threshold. Uh, they, uh, the farmer definitely had to use soil insecticide there. Uh, <clears throat> you should use a minimum of five of those traps per field. And then also you can use a shovel. Um, take out a, a scoop of soil and then take a wedge about four inches thick take that out, put it into a pan, break it apart, and count the number of wireworms that you see. Again, if you get one or more per site, then, uh, then you should use a soil insecticide. And then, now here in the fall of the year, we have a lot of fields with the uh, grain cover crop. It's not precise, but if you go out <clears throat> on a sunny afternoon with the sun behind you, look out across the field, you can see these yellow tillers. And again, when you pull these tillers up, quite often there's a wireworm inside that tiller feeding on it. And it's not precise, but it does give you some visual idea of how many wireworms are out in that field. If you find a lot of this, then you ought to use a soil insecticide. Uh, how to manage them then? Well, use a bait traps or, or some way to sample the field, get an idea of what you have. 
no till the minimum till favors the wireworms. Uh, disrupt the soil as frequently as feasible. What you want is just a large flock of birds flying along behind your tillage equipment, eating the light grubs and the wireworms. Um, <clears throat> Use soil insecticide whenever you have a concern about wireworms. Do not expect a, a reduction in the overall wireworm numbers because um, a researcher in British Columbia a few years ago found that the only insecticide that actually kills wireworms is fipronil, the active ingredient in the region. All the others make them sick, but they don't really kill them. And the wireworms recover, go on as though nothing happened. Uh, but the fipronil does take 120 days to kill the wireworm. So it's not a speedy uh, uh, way of controlling them. So with all that good news, we have two other pests that it looks like I may not have time to get to. But uh, one is carrot weevil. How many of you grow carrots? Oh, OK, a couple, all right. Um, carrot weevil is an insect that we don't know the full biology. And uh, that leads to problems. Processing carrots here, pictured here, this is all the damage of carrot weevil coming and chewing uh, on the surface and in deeper into the roots. Here's a larvae, uh, a grub, weevil grub in the pupae. When the, the grubs are mature, they move out of the carrot root, they form these pupil cells in the soil and finish their development to go on to become this weevil, about a quarter of an inch long, uh, that then goes off and starts laying eggs in, in other uh, susceptible plants. Um, the overwinter is adults. The adults lay eggs either in the petioles or in the roots. The eggs hatch, the grubs feed on the roots, and then move out and finish their development out here in the soil. Um, in uh, carrots, when the, the plants become susceptible to four leaf stage, in parsley, it's the regrowth. After the first cutting is taken off of far, uh, parsley, the uh, carrot weevils uh, go after the second cutting regrowth. OK. Um, so uh, using insecticides has not been the answer. Uh, this is a field in 2001. As nice as these carrots look here, this field was a total loss because when the field was harvested, the roots were damaged to the point that the processor rejected all the loads. Um, we uh, went in and sampled afterwards, and we came up with 650,000 weevils per acre, which is a tidy sum. And uh, there was a question about where did they overwinter, and literature had it that they overwintered in fence rows. So I had visions of weevils scampering off to the edges uh, in the fall of the year. And no, nope, they overwintered nicely in the field because here were some of the cut up carrots from that field, and here's the nice little cluster of adult weevils right there. So uh, they lay the eggs on the roots. In the, in the processing fields, we could not find any eggs laid on the petioles, they were all laid on the roots, which uh, is contrary to what the literature says. So this is another problem. I don't have any good answers on, on managing uh, the carrot weevil. And there is a parasitic wasp that uh, lays its eggs in the eggs of the carrot weevil. We found a few of those in the plot, uh, research plot. And then, <clears throat> very quickly, in just a couple of words of, uh, anybody raise peppers? If you do happen to think about raising peppers, um, you want to avoid this pest, if at all possible. Once a pepper field is infested, it becomes a race between the farmer and the weevil as to who gets the last pepper. And uh, this past year, 2019, we had 13 farms uh, four, 14 locations where we had pepper weevil infestations, and one, of the, uh, one or two of the farms, they did not harvest a single pepper because of the weevil. It's a very difficult insect pest to, uh, to deal with. So anyway, I'm done. Questions?